As we gaze up at the night sky with our eyes and our telescopes, we can see seven planets orbiting our sun, we can see millions of stars within our galaxy, and we've discovered thousands of planets around those stars. We also see hundreds of millions of galaxies. Each of those other galaxies contain hundreds of millions of stars. The universe is a very big place. And humans have looked up at all of this and wondered, are we alone? Is there anyone else out there? Or is it just us? As we try and answer these questions, we need to look all around the universe but the universe is so big, we need to narrow our scope and to figure out where we're going to look to be most efficient. So we look and see what are the requirements for life. Life on Earth requires three things. The right chemicals, the carbon, the hydrogen, the nitrogen, the potassium, the things that make us our cells and our DNA. Life also requires energy. We get our energy from food, Plants get it from the sunlight. There's even organisms that get energy from the deep ocean vents getting the heat from the interior of the earth. And as we look around, the third thing that life requires is some kind of liquid to transport those chemicals in and out of the cells. Life on earth as we know it requires water as that liquid. In fact, the tiniest drop of water the driest places with just a tiny drop of water, we find living organisms. We can find the right chemicals. They're pretty much everywhere in the universe. And there's so many different energy sources. That's not too hard. The trick is to find liquid water. And so that's really how we focus our search for life off of the Earth, is to focus on finding liquid water. And one of those places that we're spending a lot of time focusing on is Mars. Now, the reason we keep looking to Mars is because from space, we've got these spacecraft that are orbiting Mars and sending us pictures of the surface. And we see in those pictures channels that look like they've been carved like a riverbed. And we see in the bottom of these riverbeds streamlined islands where water flows around an island. It makes this teardrop shape. It's kind of indicative of water flowing. We also see impact craters, where the impact has happened in something soft, and it's flowed, and not hit something hard, but it's flowed like it hit mud. And so we see these images from space, and that makes us curious. Well, some people say it could be glaciers that cause those channels. Does it have to be liquid water? So we send our spacecraft down to the surface to get a better look. And the most recent spacecraft we sent to the surface is the Curiosity rover. She's been on the ground since August of 2012. And in the four and a half years she's been dro driving around has made some pretty amazing discoveries. Well, the Curiosity rover is the biggest, most scientifically sophisticated rover we've ever sent to Mars. She's about so big <laughs> and bigger than any other rover. This is the Mars rover family portrait of all the rovers that we've sent down to the surface. So she's big and powerful and scientifically enhanced. But how did we get this spacecraft to Mars? Well, to give you an idea of what it takes to get a spacecraft to travel to Mars, imagine shrinking the Earth 10 billion times. So that's a one with 10 zeros. And if we do that, the Earth shrinks to be something like a candy sprinkle, a little tiny blue dot. And then we shrink Mars, and Mars ends up shrinking down to be the size of a poppy seed. And our spacecraft traveled between these. But to give you an idea of that distance, take the distance between Earth and Mars, shrink that down 10 billion times, and that's the distance that they are apart. So we took our spacecraft from the tiny blue dot, sent it eight months traveling at 22,000 miles per hour, traveling 352 million miles to reach a little crater on that tiny dot. And we landed exactly where we wanted to. 
we landed in Gale Crater. Gale Crater is this 95 mile across crater on Mars. It's in the Martian tropics right near the equator, but a little bit south, about five degrees. And a notable feature in the middle of Gale Crater is this mountain that's 18,000 feet high. So why did we pick Gale Crater? Well, this is not Mars. <laughs> this is the North Dakota Badlands. But I show you this because in the Badlands, there's this exposed rock face. And this exposed rock is sedimentary rock that's built up over time. And the different layers, those stripes that you see across, are indicative of different points in geological history. And if we want to look back in time, we look deeper and deeper into the rock layer. And if we examine those rocks, it'll tell us what the Earth was like when that layer was on the surface of the Earth. So now we go to Gale Crater. And that mountain in the middle, it has an exposed rock face. And we can use that to look back in time and understand what Mars was like in the past. There's a white box up there. And inside that white box, there's a black dot. That's a boulder sitting on the surface of Mars. That's about the size of the Curiosity rover. So you can get a feel for the scale and try and imagine that rover driving amongst those hills down on the surface of Mars, trying to ex understand what Mars was like. There's another reason we went to Gale Crater. And that's because of in this upper corner here that's circled, you can see maybe a channel that's coming in. It's a river that has some tributaries. And at the bottom of that, you see a fan of lighter colored material. That's what we call an alluvial fan. It's the material that washed downstream and, and ended up at the bottom. So Gale Crater is a place where water flowed in and pooled down on the surface. So this is a really good spot to look and try and understand, are the chemicals right? Are the, is the energy right? And was there water sufficient to support life? So we're trying to figure out, is or was Mars once habitable? As we're driving around on the surface, we have discovered this rock. Curiosity gave us an image of this rock, which might just look like a piece of concrete jackhammered up from the sidewalk during some road construction. But it's a special kind of rock called a conglomerate, which is made of cementing together pieces of other rock. And that cementing together can happen by either wind or water. We know this rock had to be cemented together by water because the particles that make it up are so big they could not be carried by the wind. In fact, we know this was cemented together by fast-moving water. This rock came from the bottom of a riverbed. So we know that this is a place on Mars that water flowed. On our driving around in the Gale Crater, we drove over to a place called Ye we named Yellowknife Bay. And this image reminds us of kind of a mud flat. Kind of looks like a mud flat that dried up, that cracked surface. So we start looking a little more closely to try and understand the history of this particular place. And we look and we see rocks that have these veins, these white veins of calcium sulfate. And calcium sulfate is a mineral that's dissolved in water. And when the water evaporates, it leaves this mineral behind. And so by seeing these white veins, that tells us that water flowed through that rock. So we know this is a place where there was water. We also have other pieces of evidence we discover, little tiny black spheres. We name them blueberries, because they're about the size of a blueberry, but they're really not anything fruit-like. They're pieces of rock. They're hematite, a special type of iron that forms into a perfect circle when in the presence of water. So by finding these, it's giving us another bit of evidence that says, yes, indeed, this was a place that had water. So we're so intrigued, we get out our drill. And Curiosity has a drill. And we drill a hole. And we scoop up the drill tailings. And we analyze that. And what we find is that the rocks at this place are actually a type of clay, a type of clay that's only found in fresh water, which is unique discovery to this rover, because then other rovers have found that there was water on Mars, but it was more acidic, like a battery acid. 
This was fresh water, and it was wet for long periods of time in order to make this particular type of clay. Where we are on Mars is a dried lake bed. It's the kind of place that would be perfect should life have arisen on Mars. It would have been in a place like this. As we look at those drill tailings coming from the rocks, one thing that we've discovered is we found organic molecules preserved in those rocks, which is pretty intriguing. We don't know that those organic molecules came from any living organism or that they were left by any living organism, but it piques our interest and keeps us exploring. And so what we're doing today is driving around on the foothills at the base of Mount Sharp, trying to understand the past of Mars. And we'll continue to do this into the future with that quest to understand, is there or was there ever life on Mars? Now today, Mars is a very cold and dry place. But three and a half billion years ago, it was a, a warmer, wet place, much like the Earth a place where all the ingredients for life came together and life is abundant. But is this the only place where there's life? As Carl Sagan said, the universe is a very big place. If it's just us, it's an awful waste of space. Thank you. <laughs>